who is visiting for the first time? All right, welcome, welcome. All right. Um, do we have anybody returning? I know we have one. Do we have anybody returning from a long, maybe time away from the, the church? All right, we've got a couple. Great. Well, we have been going through this series called Reimagine, and it's on the topic of worldview. And we've been, I don't know, two and a half months maybe we've been doing worldview. And uh, uh, George has covered a lot of topics. We'll, we'll talk about a couple of them in a minute. Um, but worldview is, uh, is kind of a complex topic, so I wanted to just do a quick refresher um, so those in the room that have either been gone, who have missed, or who are just joining us have some idea of what we're talking about. Now, George talks about worldview as like your GPS guidance system uh, for, uh, for your life. Um, I'm going to get a little bit more existential and quote a philosopher, um, so bear with me. You've got to like really chew on these words. Um, James Sire is a Christian philosopher, um, and he says a worldview is a fundamental orientation of the heart that can be expressed as a story or in a set of beliefs, which may be true, partially true, or entirely false. There's a lot of people in the world that believe in things that are entirely false, and it guides their decision making. We hold these stories, like I'm from, uh, we, we think about our life in a story. You know, when, you, when somebody asks, where are you from, you might give them a a place you were born, but if, if you ask them to tell you about yourself, you're going to tell them your story. So we hold these stories, we hold these beliefs consciously, we know we have them, and unconsciously, we're unaware of them, about the basic constitution of reality. And that provides the foundation on which we live our life and engage with the world around us. James Sire that says that the first thing in our worldview starts with what we believe to be real. Do we believe that the world was created with intentionality, or do we believe that it was an accident? Was it something that just happened? Are we just the benefactors of um, a, a lucky uh, series of events um, that ended up uh, with us here on this earth? Now, if we believe that we are created, then we believe that we are created by someone, and we are guided and led by that God. But if we believe that this is an accident, then we're all on our own. And when you live life all on your own, it's going to affect how you navigate life. If you believe you are guided and led, it's going to lead to different decisions um, and perspectives. Which leads to the third of why am I here? If it's an accident and I'm just, I just happen to be alive, well then, yay for me, I'm going to pursue pleasure and I'm going to avoid pain. But if I'm here created intentionally, I'm going to pursue purpose. Um, which then leads to the question, how do we pursue that purpose? How do we pursue that pleasure? Um, and then we start making all of these discretionary decisions about what is good and what is bad. Is it my definition of right and wrong? Is my definition of what is real and true um, and good um, different than yours? What happens when we get into conflict over that? What happens when cultures decide what is right and what is wrong? Well, we would, we would advocate as Christians that God is the only one that gets to define what is good and what is evil. And that definition of good and evil creates a construct for us to navigate our life. The Israelites received the Ten Commandments, one of which we're going to talk about today. Um, and so uh, Philip Ryken, another Christian philosopher, um, says it this way as we wrap up this sort of refresher. In the end, worldview provides the structure of understanding that we use to make sense of our world. It is our way of looking at life. It's our interpretation of the universe our orientation to reality. It is the framework for our beliefs about literally everything. And so the question then becomes, what is shaping our worldview? Is it God or is it the world? Um, I think for most of us, the answer to that is, well, both. Um, for better or for worse, we're affected, our worldview is affected by both. It's affected by what we know about science. It's affected what we know about economics. It knows it's affected by what we've lived in our own experiences, um, and hopefully it's shaped very much by God's Word um, and the community of believers that we live in. Um, but it's both. Um, but today, we're going to dive deeper into one of the topics around worldview. Now, there's been a lot. We've covered everything from relationships to dating uh, to marriage, hope, um, friendships, community, um, in fact, last week, George kind of wrapped up um, the, what we might call the intimate relationship series about dating and marriage. 
um, which was really good. Um, this week, we're going to talk about parents, honoring our parents. And we're not talking about, I'm not, this isn't a message for our kids. This is a message for us adult, um, sometimes parents who are in the happy middle between we have kids of our own and we also have parents that are aging. We're talking about adult parents. Um, if I haven't met you before, I'm Aaron Sullivan, one of the shepherds here, and we're going to dive into honoring our parents. Who's heard the phrase, okay, boomer? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of funny, but it's also super disrespectful and um, il illustrative of how society today views the elderly. In America, we don't really have a culture of honoring older people. Um, I don't know if it's social media with Instagram, TikTok. Younger people get celebrated much more in our culture um, than the older generation. That is a shift that's happened in the last 50 years. That was not the case um, uh, with our aging World War I um, and World War II vets. But somewhere uh, in the last 30 or 40 years, um, the new cool thing has become what we focus on. And the knowledge and the wisdom that come with um, older people, I think, is, um, um, it's been lowered in our mind. And sure, th there's different traditions and stuff that maybe clash with newer values, but we kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater with our parents and our older folks. Um, they have a lot of wisdom to give us. But this is uh, what, at least in America, the sort of world worldview is on um, older generations. One third of seniors, one third, live with housing insecurity, which means that if the house or the place they're staying now is gone, they don't know where they're going to go. One third. Fifty percent of older seniors, I think it's 78 or 80 or older, 50 percent live completely alone. No spouse, no kids, by themselves. Less than 20 percent of seniors live multi-generationally, meaning Less than 20% are living with family. Um, and most, uh, the, the largest percentage of that in America, I think like 11, um, is within the Hispanic community. Um, they're much better at taking care um, of their parents than us white European descendants. Um, this is the world today. If there's no creator, then there's no greater commitment to oneself than to be happy. And with happy, especially in America, it's about freedom and mobility. I don't want anything tying me down. I want to be able to go where I want, work where I want, do what I want. And it's our, it's our responsibility as parents to raise children that have freedom and mobility and are happy and that there's not going to be anything of a burden placed on them. Um, we, we grow up now thinking that it is our responsibility to earn enough in our life, so by the time we have, retire, we have enough money to last us until we die. That's basically the American, the end of the American dream, is we don't want to be a burden on anybody. We need to be self-reliant. We need to be independent. I hate to break it to you, but basically the post-World War II generation is the only generation in the history of the world where that was actually achievable. It's the only one. For thousands of years, the cycle of life and death is something that we share together as a family. We are raised by our parents, we get older, we can provide, and then we take care of our parents. That's how it's always worked. This is a very small blip in world history where we don't do that. Um, but the culture has convinced us that that is the way that it's supposed to be. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that your parents have to like live in your house. My mom lives with us. But that's not, that's not what I'm saying. But we do have a responsibility to take care of our parents. We're going to dive into that a little bit more um, shortly. So this is what the world says. Well, our quest today is to discover the biblical perspective on what it means to honor our parents as adults in the world today. Things have changed since the Ten Commandments. Things have changed since Israel. Um, but what's it mean? What's the biblical perspective have to show us today? Well, we're going to start... Uh, with a threefold focus. So um, just to help keep us all tracking together, um, we're going to talk a little bit about why it's important um, to honor parents. Why, why does God think it's so important? Um, why um, honoring parents um, is such a big deal to God? And finally, we're just going to cover a couple things on how we can honor our parents today, especially as adults. So 
How important is this? How important is honoring mother and father? So the first half of the Ten Commandments have to do with loving God. So when Jesus responds, what's the greatest command? He says, oh, well, it's, it's loving God and loving people. Well, if you look at the Ten Commandments, they are split literally in two. The first half is all about loving God. And the second half is all about loving people. And it starts with honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. The first command about loving people in the Ten Commandments is about honoring your parents. Positionally, oh, actually, first, yeah, honor. So, you're, okay, what's honor mean? Um, so, honor is the word that uh, we translate it into. That's the, the translators have chosen the word honor. Uh, the Hebrew word is kavod, um, but it doesn't quite carry the same meaning. Um, just uh, kavod is like your reputation and honor. It has a bunch of other meanings in Hebrew, but they've chosen rightly the word honor. In the Webster's Dictionary, honor is defined as to regard or treat someone with admiration and respect. To regard or treat with honor. To give special recognition to, to confer honor on, or to live up and fulfill the terms of a commitment. That is what it means to honor someone. To regard or treat our parents with admiration and respect. To treat our parents with honor. To give special recognition to our elders. To confer honor on our gray hairs, to live up and to fulfill the terms of a commitment of being a child. Positionally, in the Ten Commandments, this is more important than adultery, envy, slander, theft, and murder. Positionally. Meaning that God chose to put that above all of those other commands, which is like almost, you're like, ah, it's a mistake. That was an accident. It was supposed to be lower. Um, uh, and if you don't believe me, then let's look at some of the uh, consequences um, of, that God gave the Israelites for breaking this command. Um, this one's it's kind of funny. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline them, him, they will not listen to them. His father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city at the gate of the place where he lives, and they shall say to the elders of the city, This is our stubborn and rebellious son. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. <laughs> I mean, look, that's just the Bible. I'm just saying. Like, it's not, you know, I didn't add anything to this. This is just what the Bible says. Um, not that I'm advocating that we take uh, our sons who do something stupid and take them out to the city gates. <laughs> but it does demonstrate how serious God takes this. Um, now, it's not just, it's not just, God's not also just saying, hey, take it really seriously because I've got big punishments for you. He also gives promises. This is the only command in the Ten Commandments that comes with a promise. It's the only one. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So Paul, writing to the church of Ephesus, here in Ephesians 6, 1, 4, is quoting um, the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. You know, uh, everybody knows the idea of cause and effect right? There's, there's actions and there's consequences. Um, when it comes to the Lord, we don't always get insight into the direct cause-effect relationship and things. So if, you know, you're like, well, if I honored my parents, they're poor, they're, maybe they're not great people, they're not gonna, that's not gonna turn out for me in any sort of physical, real way. But that's not how God's economy works. God gives commands and God blesses. What happens in his cosmic plans around your life is way outside of what we can observe and we can see. So we can't just take this at like face value that, well, that's just not going to work out for me. No, look, he's giving you a promise. If you honor your parents, it will go well with you in your land. How he does that, we don't always get insight into. But the fact is he's made that promise, right? So it's, there's, both, there's both the promise here for him to bless you and the promise here to judge you 
if you do not fulfill this very essential command. Okay. Why is, it, why is loving our parents so important to God? All right, so it's clear that it is important. Why is it so important? The first one I go back to the greatest command, love God and love people. There is no greater command than this. Um, if Jesus calls us to love our enemies, he's definitely calling us to love our parents, despite if they were good parents or not. Right? And if we are honest with ourselves, especially those that are parents, um, we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to hope that our kids love us through those mistakes. Um, Jesus um, has this really interesting interaction. Um, it's, I think it's in at least three the Synoptic Gospels. Um, and it has to do with him arguing with religious leaders. And this, this puts into perspective just how important this is to Jesus. Right? And Jesus said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained for me is Corban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. Corban means dedicated. So basically they're saying, hey, I would have money to help my parents, but I tithed. And Jesus is like, you're missing the point completely, right? It would be better that you don't give anything to the temple if it means loving your parents, loving other people. The tithe is, the tithe, get you, we lose perspective on the tithe or the gift or the setting aside of money when, uh, we did, when we separate it from the whole purpose of it, which is to help to love people, to give people here uh, spiritual encouragement, and support. But if that comes at the expense of you loving your own parents, then Jesus says your tradition of men has made void the word of God. That's how important it is to Jesus. He's like, don't give anything to the temple. Like, give it to, like, help your parents. Help love the elderly. But of course, the, the argument he made against this is, well, my parents suck. Um, my father, many of you know this, um, but so my dad moved, I don't know, he slept with my mom when I was three. He moves out. I saw him five days a week, or five days a year maybe. Some years we didn't. Um, when I was 21, and he never knew how to relate to me. So when I was 21, I started to develop more of a relationship with my dad. Um, but, you know, kind of after we just kind of had this breakthrough, uh, he killed himself. He took his life uh, uh, 2007. My dad never did really anything to deserve honor or respect from me. He never did. He, he was an absent father in every way, shape, or form. My relationship with him after he died stayed the same as it was before, effectively. But I would love to have the chance to honor my father today. When we love people, especially people who don't deserve it, it transforms them. Right? And it's not just, why do you think that Jesus calls us to love our enemies? Right? It's because loving our enemies is actually the only way that, that the light of God is able to enter their heart. When we fight violence with violence or death with death or dishonor with dis dishonor, the cycle just continues every time. That is why you break the cycle through loving your enemies, even to the point of death, even to the point of death on a cross, because paradoxically, somehow, that's the way God changes the heart of men and women. Um, if I had the chance to love my father today, I do believe that that love, Jesus through me, could transform him. So whether your parents are worthy of honor or not, that's immaterial to God. It is our call and our duty to honor them. And truth is, no one's perfect. You're not perfect, and your kids will have to love you in your imperfect state, um, you either are or will or w have been imperfect. Um, and, you know, that's just humanity. That's what we're messed up, you know? And we have that in common. Some of us maybe just show it a little bit more, um, uh, especially as parents. Mercy and forgiveness, as I mentioned, extend beyond our neighbors and our enemies, but they even extend to our parents, which it's so easy. So when you're in re close relationships with people, those are oftentimes the places where our ugliness comes out 
the most where we have like permission uh, to not be like Jesus. Um, but those are the areas where we should be the most like Jesus. Um, yes, even to our parents. When uh, Jesus says, he says, what reward is there um, in loving your neighbor or your family? Even the Gentiles do that. Um, that's human. It, when people are worthy of love and they love us and we love them back, that's just human, right? When we love, in spite of the fact that people have failed us, in spite of the fact that they didn't uphold their commitment to us, that's truly divine. That is the love of Jesus, when you can love beyond uh, what we've been engineered in our DNA to do anyway. All right, what is the second reason we should love our parents, other than God says so? Um, because you literally owe them your life. If you didn't have your parents and that combination of DNA, you would not be you. If your mom didn't carry you in her womb for nine months, in Jessica's case, 55 weeks, then you wouldn't be alive. Um, you literally owe them your life. Parenting, as you know, parents, requires a lot of sacrifice. If you didn't have kids, you'd probably be a millionaire or something, you know? They're like, it's so expensive. It's crazy. Just bleeding cash constantly, you know? Um, oh, I want to do gymnastics. I want to do soccer. I, I suck at math. I need to do mathnasium. You're like, oh, it's thousands of dollars. Um, no, it's good. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so being, being a parent requires sacrifice. And that's why, look, Parents don't describe their, well, typically, parents don't typically uh, talk about their children as burdens. They're not like, oh, we have another burden on the way, you know? Um, <laughs> um, maybe more so now. In, uh, uh, I heard an interesting stat. I can't say that it's true, but it sounds right. Um, I heard that in farm life, a, ch a child hits net positive, like feedback to the farm, when they're nine years old. So by the time they're nine, they're producing more for the farm than they are consuming. I'm like, now it's like 35, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, video games, right. Yeah, so, so um, in any case, being a parent um, uh, is difficult, and raising kids is difficult, and it requires sacrifice. So why would it be any different when our parents get to old age that it wouldn't require some sacrifice without using words like burden, right? It's just part of life, you know? You know, working is hard. It's not, it's not necessarily burdensome. If it is, find something else to do. Um, taking care of parents is just part of it. It's part of the gift that God has given us. Everything that he's given us has an appointed time in our life. It's all equally a gift, even if it's hard. Proverbs 23, 22. Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Israelites had this problem, we've got this problem. That's why this proverb is here. Pension, Social Security, and 401k retirement, um, ending in a retirement home and then eventually hospice, um, is, is, it's not, it's not going to last. There is a massive housing crisis in Southern California for people who are retiring. Why? Because it's almost, there, now it's, there, are, there is a subset of jobs that are going to net you enough income in your life to be able to retire maybe in a more comfortable way um, in a retirement home, but not most jobs, right? That's just, it's just not possible anymore. Inflation has gone up, um, not just this year, but it has been going up. It outpaced, it's outpaced wages uh, growth for the last 40 years. It's becoming more difficult. And my grandfather, many of your grandfathers, earned pensions, from companies like Ford where they worked for 30 years. They can't afford to do pensions anymore. And we stay in jobs for like four or five years. Culturally, economically, um, relying on the social safety net post-World War II, it's not possible in America. And it hasn't been possible in most of the world, even for the last 50 years. And it hasn't been possible in history for thousands of years. It's a blip. So we need to get out of our head that that's like how it's supposed to work. It's not. Not for God and, frankly, I think he's putting the conditions together that it's not 
going to keep working. We're going to have to figure this out and get back on the same page with them. You just keep freezing. All right. Number three, you owe them for the good life. Um, not only do we owe our parents our life, but we owe them for the good life, or at least trying. And I'm talking to the, the, the adults here who had truly good parents who were trying to raise them up in the Lord. Like I said, it's not an excuse to not take care of your parents or honor them um, if they were bad, um, but especially if they were good. And many of us had great parents. My mom was a great mom. Uh, Proverbs 4, 1 through 6. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I, too, was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me, and he said to me, Take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands, and you will live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. Proverbs, the whole book, is all about the generational teachings and learnings of the Israelites over, over hundreds of years that have been compiled into a nice little package to be able to have parents help teach their children. God inspired um, this wisdom amongst, uh, um, amongst his people. And Proverbs 1 through 9 is all about speeches of a father and mother to their child to get them to listen to their instruction. Now, I don't know about you, but I did plenty of things in my life that my mom said was dumb that ended up with consequences. Um, that's part of just growing up. Um, but when we hold to those teachings, I mean, how many people could raise their hand here and say, yeah, you know, when I graduated from high school, I kind of ran off and did some stupid stuff, but those words and those things that your parents planted when you were young come back to you, right? They come back to you. Those words come back. Um, even uh, people who would recognize themselves as atheists or agnostic that were raised in Christian homes, they can't help but carry many of those values into their adulthood. Um, and this is, this is the role of a good father and a good mother, to raise their children up with sound instruction. And gosh, if you've seen people who did have um, bad parents or who were abandoned completely, their lives take a while typically to get back on track. Just be thankful to your parents um, that they were following God and raising you um, in a good way. All right, last, uh, last section. How does God call us to love our parents? One, respect and affirm our parents. Respect and affirm them. Deuteronomy 5.16, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long, and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long. Honor and affirm them. And now our life expectancies, they're pretty long, so you've got some time, you know, to figure out how to do that. Two, take care of your parents. This is, this is super convicting. Uh, yeah. If you didn't, if you were like, I don't, know about, I don't know about the Ten Commandments, Old Testament, Old Law, well, this is, this is Paul writing to Timothy. Timothy 5.3. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents for this pleasing to God. So take care of widows in your church. But if they have children or grandchildren, they need to put their religion into action and start taking care of them, right? Repaying their parents and grandparents. Like literally saying it, exactly as we've been talking about all day. Take care of your parents and repay them, period. This is, this, is, this is Paul talking to Timothy. And if you don't, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Like, there's not even any room for interpretation here, right? There's no room for debate. Take care of your parents. Take care of your elders. Three, bring your parents joy. Bring your parents joy. Call them. My mom lives with us, so it's easy. We just talk every night at dinner. Um, and my dad's gone, so, you know. Uh, and, um, but for many of us, our parents live, I don't know, 
Anybody's parents live on the East Coast? Anybody's parents live in the Midwest? Anybody's parents live outside of a distance in which you can travel in, you know, two hours by car? Call them, right? Call them. Visit them, right? Calls are, calls are something, but man, there's nothing like seeing people face to face. And uh, I know you'd rather go to Cabo, <laughs> but go to St. Louis and visit your parents. <laughs> now, Jared's a good kid. He's, he's, he's visiting his, his parents in like three months. Christmas. Sweet. Send them photos. If, if, you, if they, like, I think you probably can. I mean, most people now can use email or they've got a smartphone. Set them up a smartphone. Send them an iPhone 14 iPhone SE, <laughs> send them photos. There's actually this new, uh, it's awesome. Uh, my, my wife's grand, grand, great-grandmother, um, no, grandmother, is, uh, she's, like she's like 96. She's in, uh, she's in uh, an Alzheimer's like, treatment facility, um, extended care, and there's this photo frame, and you can just upload photos to it, and they just magically appear, right? Yeah, it's awesome, you know? You don't have to, she doesn't have to do anything, they just... Family members just pop up on this photo frame. Um, you should check it out. Send them photos. These are not hard. Like, these are easy ones. Include them in your life. Um, I could do a better job of this. We, like, it's just being around somebody doesn't necessarily mean you're including them in your life. So find ways where they feel a part of the family. Find ways where you talk to them and ask them for their advice. Our elders have a mountain of wisdom to share with us. Ask them for it. Include them in your life. If necessary, support them. That might mean you pay for car insurance and the cell phone. That might mean that when the toilet breaks, you go over and you fix it, right? But support them how you can. And if necessary, take care of them. So that could be taking care of them in their own house, taking care of them at an old folks facility, taking care of them in your own house, whatever's suitable to you, but the command is super clear. You will take care of your parents, or there will be judgment. And if you do, there's a promise. Then your days will be prolonged, and all will be good for you. Now, of course, we know when we read Ecclesiastes, that's not always true, but generally speaking, when we do the right thing for the Lord, he does, he does repay us, and we don't know how. We can't see the fabric of cause and effect, but in his economy, um, he does bless his people. He does fulfill his promises every single time, in this life or the next. Um, if necessary, invite them into your home. Notice I didn't say if necessary, let them live with you. <laughs> if necessary, invite them into your home. All right. Again? Come on. Keynote's failing me here. Go back to Microsoft. All right. Jared, I'm almost, almost done. Cool. Um, so, uh, parents, uh, my encouragement to you, final word, just so this, this sermon's not completely un unbalanced for all of our adult children in the room. Um, be worthy of being honored. Be that parent that does offer good advice. Be that parent that wants to help raise the grandchildren. Be that parent that does the things that God commands you to truly be worthy of being honored. And children, do it anyway, even if they don't, because the Lord commands it. All right. Our homework this week uh, for the small groups, the home gatherings. Um, yeah, we're good. You can hold on. Um, this, is a good, this is just a good reflection question for any of us, whether you're, like, crushing it and honoring your parents or not. Um, what's holding you back from honoring your mother and father further? What, what's holding you back? Is there resentment? Is there pain? Is there forgiveness that needs to happen? Is there mercy that you need to find uh, that the Lord has given you? What's holding you back from honoring them further? And the second one is, because some of us may not have um, our parents anymore. Um, what is holding you back from honoring your spiritual mothers and fathers in your church or in your community? Right? Our family in Jesus is much more than who we were born from or who we give birth to. Our family has been redefined as the family of believers that God gives us in any place or time within the church. And so we have lots of spiritual mothers um, and fathers. Um, Jim is one of my spiritual fathers, right? How can I honor Jim more? So, this week in your home gatherings, 
Um, think through these questions. Wrestle with them together. Um, and if you're not in a home gathering, wrestle um, with them on your own. Um, but let's try to reimagine what it means to honor our parents as adults in this age.